Hey everybody, so I'm Gadget Guy, and I'm really excited about this one today. Quietly, Google has released their Google Camera app. This is a standalone camera app directly from Google, sort of based on uh, the camera app that's found in the Nexus. And if you've used the, uh, the camera on the Motorola X, it's very similar to that as well. But now anyone running KitKat is going to be able to have a stock camera experience. And this is this is kind of exciting for me because it means that no matter what phone you go to in the future, if you really like this camera, you'll be able to install it on any future phone that you use. And so right now I'm testing this on the LG G2 and I love the camera hardware on the LG G2, but I can't say I'm always a huge fan of the camera app. I have some criticisms over how that app performs, especially for how good the 13 megapixel image sensor is. So it's very often that I'll use an app like Vignette to take my stills and then I'll rely on the stock camera for video and then of course Instagram just for uploading and stuff like that. But now we've got this Google camera app and I did like the photo app on the Moto X. So now we're gonna go through all of the features on the Google camera. This is the layout that we see when we fire up the Google camera. And this entire bar right here is basically a shutter. So if you tap anywhere, it's going to take a picture. And especially since this mount that I'm using is a little on the wobbly side. My photos are probably gonna kind of come out blurry. The one thing that I think will help in terms of just general ergonomics is that no matter how you're holding your phone, you know, you're trying to focus with one finger and then you try and like reach another finger to hit the shutter. This should be easily accessible on the right hand side at least, no matter what you're holding the phone with or how you're holding the phone or what you're trying to focus on uh, for your subject. And we have some quick actions here. I have already turned on manual exposure. Uh, so this helps us control the brightness or the darkness of the scene when the phone is going through a rendering, the final JPEG. If you are interested in making your smartphone photos look better, this is a number one, the feature I would most look at you know, learn how to use it, get used to using it, because this this one setting here alone has improved my smartphone photos tremendously. Uh, but we can check out the rest of them. We can turn on grid. I've already turned on the grid, but we can turn off the grid. Uh, we can toggle sort of a rule of thirds just to help you line up shots for more interesting composition. We can turn on an HDR mode, which we'll play with in just a second. And then we have flash controls. I usually leave my flash completely off. Uh, and I only turn it on when I absolutely have to. And then we can toggle the uh, the front facing or the rear facing camera. I'm actually not gonna turn on the front facing camera just because it's uh, partially blocked over here by my mount, but then also because I just got done with a workout and I'm looking pretty gross right now. To change various settings, you swipe from the side. And when the phone's in portrait, it's also the left hand side that you swipe from. But we now have photosphere capabilities, panorama. We have a lens blur feature. We're gonna take a look at that. I can't say I love the implementation on lens blur, but if you play with it a little bit, you can get some really interesting results out of it. And of course our standard camera and our video uh, features. Now, whenever you swipe in, that menu key becomes an extra settings key. And, and this is a little confusing to me. I, I kind of wish that this settings uh, were just under the regular menu. You could, you, know, you could always go to your menu and, and change the settings from there. It only pops up when you're in this scene changing between the various uh, modes that the, that the camera can use. But if we take a look at what's in there, we can jump in. We can go through resolution and quality. So the back camera, we can reduce the quality if we wanna you know, maybe save a little storage or make our photos easier to email. We can go down to like a seven or a three megapixel image. Whoops, I want mine on 13 because I don't care about how much data I use. Um, we can also do the same, the same thing with video. It starts out at 1080p, we can reduce it to 720 or 480. We can also change the quality on the panoramas. Uh, I'm gonna leave mine at high because that's usually pretty good, but you can set it to maximum if you want each piece of your panoramic picture to be a 13 megapixel image stitched together. Uh, that'd be a pretty honking big photo. And then the lens blur quality, you can set it to low if you want that to process faster, but I like spending the extra time for better looking images and video. So I just leave mine at high. And the rest of these camera app settings are very simple. You can toggle location. I usually leave location off. And then if we come into these advanced settings, this is where you get the manual exposure option. So go into your uh, side menu to toggle the different camera settings and then get into this and turn on manual exposure. You'll thank me once you figure out how to use it. Now we're using this on one of the most powerful smartphones <laughs> in the Android ecosystem today, but performance is pretty snappy. Now, it's not as fast as say like an iPhone 5S. I still think that's the fastest camera on the market today, but it is a very clean, very simple, very quick 
camera app. And the nice thing is, is it's now going to translate across any other phone that you load it on. And whenever you're done snapping pics, you just slide to the side and you can see all of the photos that you just took. I have a bunch of photos of the same thing because of the way that I'm set up here. Uh, and then this also ties into the Google Photos app right there. You can see in the, in the left-hand corner. So uh, that, that instantly launches you into your ability to share via Google Plus or via any other service that's loaded on your phone. And then if we take a look at some of the other settings, if we go into video, it's the same general setup. At least now we can see this, this, right, this right hand side has become semi-transparent. So once we focus in on our subject, we can start shooting video and it reduces down so that now it's just a stop button, but uh, it, it doesn't take up the whole screen because this really should be a wide angle view so that you can see what your subject looks like in the frame that you're trying to shoot. Now, one of the things I really like about the video setting on the Google camera as opposed to the stock LG camera app is the ability to pre-focus on your subject. So if I wanna focus right there, I can pre-focus there, and that's what the camera is focused on before I start shooting video and that's the subject of my video. On the LG camera app, you can't do that. So here we are in the LG camera app, and I'm gonna switch this to video, and I'm gonna tap on the screen, and nothing happens. This drives me crazy. And the LG camera app does a lot of focus breathing, so even once you settle in on the subject, it's constantly pulsing through the focus to try and make sure it's still locked on whatever you wanna shoot. It's trying to be so helpful, it actually sort of degrades the performance of the awesome camera hardware built onto the back of this phone. We do not have that problem in the Google camera app and that makes me so happy. Okay, so we can try and do a photosphere. This isn't something that I'm very good at. I'm universally terrible at doing panorama shots. But the idea is you move the phone around, trying to keep the phone in the same position in space, but you, oh, I need that right there. You just pivot it and twist it, and you should be able to come up with a, a 3D-ish, not 3D, you should be able to come up with sort of a, a vertical and horizontal panorama of what a scene looks like, and you can usually go 360 degrees. Um, I'm not doing this very well, but it's not a feature that's usually built into other uh, third-party camera apps, the, the apps that come on our on our phones uh, delivered by you know Samsung or LG. This is this is something that's sort of unique to the Nexus and the Motorola's. I'm not doing a very good job of showing this off. It's really kind of hard to see what you're shooting at. And really, all we're going to end up is with is a blurry, messy photo of my dirty uh, office here. Okay, and here's my horribly abortive <laughs> photosphere. Uh, it did an okay job of sort of lining up some of those elements, and especially because I was twisting the phone around a lot more. It's actually, in my opinion, it's really hard to line up a good photosphere. So those few that you see online, uh, those are people who really know what they're doing, and they probably had a lot of patience in you know making sure that the phone was lining up perfectly for each of these pieces. But you can see you can get a really cool sort of uh, you know vertical and horizontal panorama effect. So it's definitely a feature I would recommend playing with, even though I don't ever have very good luck in getting results out of it. The other kind of cool feature is this lens blur. Now you want to keep your subject really close to the camera lens for this one, no more than about five feet. But what you do is you focus on your subject and then you pivot the camera so that it can collect more information on about as to what the background of your scene looks like and anything that sort of moves more than your subject is going to get blurred out in post, which is kind of cool. Uh, it, it helps lend that extra creamy bokeh uh, like when you have a really shallow depth of field on a high-end camera. So we're gonna take the photo and now we're gonna move up just a little bit. So now that we've taken our lens blur photo, we can come into this little shutter icon here and we can control how much of the background blurriness effect that we wanna use. I mean, if you hit the slider all the way over, the blurriness will actually start to impact your subject. Your subject will start getting hazy around the edges. But I'm only gonna say, let's move it back to about there, well, even just a little bit more. You know, I'm gonna put it at, th at, a, at just a little bit more than three quarters, and now I'm gonna hit done, and it's gonna render that image out. 
And you can see it's actually a pretty profound effect. It's, it's really pleasant in, in hyper isolating your subject and smearing out all that additional detail in the background. I mean, as you can see on this other photo, even though it was taken from a little bit farther away, all of this busyness on these uh, horrible packing blankets that I have up on the walls for sound deadening, you know, it's a really busy and it's kind of an ugly background. But with that lens blur effect, now you can really get up close on your subject and your eye is drawn to this and you just sort of have some blueness in the background. It's, it's actually a really nice effect and I'm glad to see that they're working in some of these little photographic tweaks and tricks into their stock simple camera app. And taking a quick look at the HDR setting, we're gonna toggle that back on and that disables the flash. So we can now focus in here and we're going to take a photo. And it's a really, really fast HDR setting. It doesn't do that thing where it takes a long time to scan through multiple images and exposures. Though I wish it would tell us how many exposures it was taking or if this is just totally a software trick to, uh, to sort of fake an HDR photo. But here, we're gonna do this one more time. I'm gonna focus right there. And it takes one photo reasonably quickly. Now, uh, you're not really gonna be able to see much of a difference on these shots right here. Uh, just because, you know, uh, this, this indoor scene that I've created just to test the camera isn't necessarily the nicest, but you'll just have to take my word for it. The, the performance on this is, is, it's a subtle HDR effect, just subtly bringing up the shadows and, and uh, brightening some of the darker elements without overexposing any of the uh, highlights of the scene. And uh, it does so surprisingly quickly, uh, considering how simple this app is. And just to show you guys, this is the Google Camera app running on my HTC One Mini, just in case you were concerned about any performance issues there might be, it's still a pretty responsive and quick camera experience. So again, as long as you're running KitKat, no fear, uh, it seems pretty well optimized even for dual core devices. And this is what I'm talking about in terms of consistency of design and experience. So now if I were to switch from an HTC phone to an LG phone or to a Samsung phone, I can always count on knowing exactly where everything is. I don't have to relearn an interface. And even though I really do like the HTC camera app, um, I like the HTC camera app a lot better than I like the LG camera app. I, it, I'm still in that ballpark of considering maybe switching over to this as my daily driver for camera stuff, just so that I don't constantly have to remember where various settings are, remember where different features are. Even just for me as a gadget blogger, this helps sort of streamline the photography experience on any phone that I might use uh, starting today or in the future. Now, maybe one of the only drawbacks to this Google Camera app, aside from the fact that it's just super, super simple, is the quality of JPEG that it saves is actually a little on the low side. So this is a photo that I took with the Google Camera app. This is a photo that I took with Vignette, one of my favorite camera apps in the Android store. And then this is one of, the, and this is the last photo I took with the LG, the stock camera that comes with the LG G2. And so if we come in here, we can uh, fire these up. So I can just scan through real quick. And to my eye, the color and saturation and white balance on the Google camera and on Vignette are very similar. And they're, they're not very hyped, they're not very saturated photos, but this is very much what this scene looks like in my office right now. Sort of a dull blue for these packing blankets. They're not very vibrant. And you can see a lot of the detail in the flower and the ship and the red is very subdued on my little Buddha there. If you turn on the LG camera app, the LG camera app is really focusing on making a bright, vivid, vibrant image, so it's goosing the saturation. It's a more pleasant image, but it's not as accurate for what the scene really looks like in real life. But we also wanna look at how much information is actually retained. And you can always look at a JPEG as being something similar to like an MP3. You take the raw data off the camera and then you squish it down into a very small file size, which makes it easier to attach to an email or upload onto the web. And so if we come in here and we hit our details, uh, the Google camera saved a 3.1 megabyte file Vignette, and this is why it's one of my favorites, saved a 6.8 megabyte file. And then the LG camera app, uh, it's a little bit more of a normal camera app again, it saved a 3.8 megabyte file. So there's a little bit more information retained in the LG camera app. There's a lot more information <laughs> retained in the Vignette app. And this helps also with post-production. So like you take a photo and then later if you wanna edit it, there's just that little bit more information for you to tweak colors, to crop, and, and not have blurry or uh, uh, messed up distorted images. But then the Google camera retains the least amount of information out of all the camera apps that I currently have loaded on this phone. So that's a little 
little bit of a bummer, but for the run and gun, the simplicity of the app, and any time that this app gets updated, you're gonna get those updates directly from the Google Play Store. You don't have to wait for a whole ROM download uh, just to get some an update to your camera software. Now, the last little hiccup for this Google Camera app, and I can't be 100% certain, but I don't think this camera app is interacting with the optical image stabilization built into the G2. Now, I could totally be wrong, and someone please correct me down in the comments if I am, but I think LG is using proprietary software to control the image stabilization built into the lens on the G2, and I don't think the Google Camera app has access to that API, if there even is an API. I don't think it has access to that software. But then for other phones, especially you know, like, you know, like the HTC One Mini, which doesn't have image stabilization anyway, the Moto X, which doesn't have image stabilization, the Nexus, uh, those cameras don't have image stabilization, so this camera app's gonna work just as well as any other that you might use. I, I do wish they had a little bit more of a steady shot system built into this so that it would detect vibrations and then try and take the photo whenever your hands are the least shakiest. That's something that's on vignette that I like a lot. But so long as you know that that's what's happening with your hardware, you'll at least be better informed and better prepared to take better photos with your smartphone camera. So folks, this has been the Google Camera. I am super stoked that Google has released this as a standalone app. Like I said before, now you can always count on your camera software getting its own updates uh, whenever Google rolls one. You don't have to wait for a full ROM update. And if you ever switch phones and you get used to this camera, you can easily transition to another phone and still have the same photographic and video experience that you had before. Uh, as always, folks, thanks so much for watching my videos, subscribing to my channel, sharing my videos. You guys have been awesome. And leaving me comments and, and hitting that thumbs up button down, uh, down under my videos. Uh, I've always had a lot of fun getting into conversations with you guys and, and those fun civil debates that we've had. So as always, thanks so much for watching and I will catch you all on the next video.